Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a beautiful day to gather together and to have a place to come to meet here to remember that in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed, and therefore he blessed and sanctified the seventh day as a remembrance to who he is, the creative work that he does in our lives, and the mercy that he gives to each and every one of us. I hope that today as you gather here, you can simply receive the blessing that it is to know who God is, to remember what he said of himself and his word and the things that he has done and the things that he is accomplishing. And also to those of you who are streaming online, wherever you are, that the spirit of the Lord and the anointing of God would come to you this day and give you a refreshment and the mercy. One of the most beautiful things that we read about in the word of God is that when Jesus Christ entered the flesh and walked on the earth, he went about doing his father's business. And he went about being so merciful, so compassionate, and always looking to do things that are right and good and that build up and edify other people. And I want to talk to you a bit about that here today. And I'd like to begin uh, this message. If you turn with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, we're going to be taking a little break here today from this, uh, the series that I've been working through on the Holy Spirit prayer list, but God willing, we'll get back to that. But today we want to talk about another topic with you, and that is uh, beginning here in Mark chapter 1, in verse 14, it says, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I just want us to think about these verses a little bit, and I want us to put our attention on Jesus Christ right now, and just think of Christ coming, the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us, who walked among us, Emmanuel, that as he was living on this earth, he came to this point, and it was after John was put in prison. I want you to even think about the time that it was, because at that time, as Jesus is in Judea, he is in an occupied territory, occupied by the Roman government. It was basically a, a king Herod set up as a king for the region, and a governor that we see later in Pontius Pilate, who was ruling, and there was a military rule in that area. There, was, there were Roman soldiers, there were centurions. Jesus came to an occupied place, and when John spoke out against the adultery being committed, basically his life was forfeit to prison and then ultimately to a beheading to death. So I want us to think about the times and the seasons that Jesus came into. It wasn't all just happiness going on among the Jews that were living in the promised land, but rather there was an occupation. There were things going on in the times. And so notice again, he says, so John was put in prison. It was after John that Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now I want us to really think about Jesus' heart and Jesus' attitude and really focus on what he's doing because it's I don't believe it's just a passing over of the scripture that John the Baptist, who was the one to prepare the way, is put in prison. But what did Jesus do? He went about preaching good news. In trying times, in hard times, in stressful times, he went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Because the resolutions that we may want as mankind for peace and for justice and for righteousness and goodness and governing forces is something that has plagued mankind and that God had prophesied about from the very beginning about how man would rule and man would oppress in a life of sin. Even the very thought in Genesis 3 when man had sinned, the curse of woman was to be under the authority of a man. Why? Because who wants to be under the authority of someone who sins? And what do we find in government? We come under people who sin. What has government been about? Ultimately, corruption. 
And so governments in all their various forms get set up to either control or to try to prevent control, right? The, this republic was set up to try to prevent people from trying to take control of the citizens of the United States. But what happens inevitably is people try to take control of others. It's the way of man. And there are pushes where men seek to oppress and then men push back. And men seek to oppress and men push back. And wars and violence and hardship and heartache and injustice come because there is this desire that is not from God to oppress people rather than to serve people because we by nature find that there is selfish desire. And we by nature get wounded and hurt and we fight against the pain. And rather than responding as God would have us do, we respond according to what we would deem to be good or wise or just. Today, when Denise was reading the scripture in Romans 12, when it talks about overcoming evil with good, it lays out a way that is not of this world and is not of the heart and mind of man. It is a very different way of thinking, a different way of governing and being governed. It is the difference between the rulership and governance of this world and the rulership and governance of Almighty God. They're not the same. They're not the same. And when Jesus came, comes about and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, I want us to, to realize that Jesus is offering something that this world cannot offer because it does not know it or is acquainted with it. Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. But what he is bringing to us yet even this day is the kingdom of God is near. Why was it near? Because it all starts with a king. A kingdom starts with the rulership of a king. The kingdom starts with the rulership of who that king is and what that territory is and what those laws are going to be, where this governance is going to take place and how it's going to look and the people that are going to be involved in this. And the kingdom of God was near because the king was near. And the ways of the king came near. And he could say the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is close to you. Repent and believe this good news. That there is a good news that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ that answers the questions to the world's problems and the civilization's problems. And my friends, this is where it begins. And it begins in the hearts and minds of every person who receives of this kingdom who receives of this king, because the very first territory God is looking to conquer is the one that is in your own heart and mind to see and experience the kingdom in your own life, to know what it is to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. John was taken away Jesus walked in occupied land, and he went about preaching freedom in the gospel of the kingdom of God. Are you receiving of this gospel today? I want you to think about a few things, and if you're taking notes, think of these concepts as we talk today. That one, Jesus came to preach good news, the good news of the kingdom of God. And then he said to repent and then believe the gospel. It's important that we understand these things and how they work together and what Jesus was really doing and looking to do. I want you to turn with me now over to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and notice with me here in verse 35. Matthew 9 and verse 35, where it says, in Matthew 9, 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. What does his kingdom look like? 
We're not going to turn there, but I want you to remember that when Jesus sent out the 70 and he gave them a power and authority, and, and he said, go into the cities and where they receive you, he said, heal the sick and say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God has come near to you. What is the kingdom of God about? What makes it so different than the ways of this world and the kingdoms of this world? Why is it that there is a prophecy that says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever? Why do we celebrate that? You see, where we are in the difference of where life is today and where the world is going today is in the world and in the kingdoms of this world, there is trouble. There is tribulation. And what Jesus comes to bring is something completely different. Do you ever think about just from a standpoint that we are so used to living in a world where there is hatred, there is violence, where there is sickness, there is lawlessness, that this pervades the world in different places? We don't always see it, but it it runs in an undercurrent. And what we promote and do. You know, I love this country. I love so many things about this country and so many blessings that have been afforded. But I can also look and say, you know, there's no country in this world that has ever promoted war like we have. It's kind of a sick feeling when we like to think that we are peace-loving people, and if you look... Basically, of all the exports in the world, of every country and nation that buys weapons, you ever think about the fact that 35% of those come from the United States? Russia second, 22%. Everybody else? Yeah, it's like under 10%. We, we, we export it more than anybody. See, I don't like that about this country. I don't, I don't like that we promote war. I love the promise that Jesus said that they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, and they will not learn war anymore. I'm more interested in that kingdom. Why would we ever want to be a part of something that continues to involve so much violence and hatred and death and destruction? How much will be enough? And yet it is in the hardest of times that the word of God comes so simply and saying, don't you see that what I want to do is tell you this kingdom is going to put an end to all that. And in this kingdom, my kingdom, Jesus says, there's healing. See, Jesus brings love for where there is hate. Jesus brings kindness and consideration where there's rudeness and selfishness. Jesus brings peace to places where there is war. Jesus wants to bring life to where there is death. Jesus comes to bring healing to where people are broken and hurting. And the gospel that Jesus was bringing in a time of an occupied land, in a time of disquietness, when John the Baptist, who many were wondering, is he the man? Is he the Messiah? And John kept saying, no, no, it's Jesus who's coming after me. Here he is being put into prison. Here he is about ready to have his head chopped off. And here is Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, giving good news to say, it's not about this. I want you to know of a different way and a different kingdom. And so, again, notice Jesus goes about in the cities, verse 35, in villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And I want you to just notice the nature of this king. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. What drove Jesus to give the good news? What drove Jesus to give healing? It was the will of the Father, which is a will of mercy and compassion, 
to bring healing to people who are in need, to give direction to people that are lost, to give relief to people that are weary and burdened. You know, I've heard it said quite a bit recently that, you know, it's times like this that we really need Jesus. And that's true. But before this all started, they, it was times like this that we really needed Jesus. Sometimes we look at circumstances and it gets us a little more desperate. We look at the, the symptoms of a, of a problem that's going on and we say, how does it get to this? Where there can be lawlessness, there can be anarchy, there can be such injustice, and injustice met with other injustice, where there can be such uprisings, where there can be such disquietness. You see, when circumstances come in our lives and we start to see reactions, we start to see the way we deal with it personally or we see the way others deal with it, what it's really doing is exposing what is already there. It exposes the truth of what's there in the nature, what comes out. Circumstances bring out what is there. What do we do with it? How do we address it? How do we solve it? You see, what I think is so powerful about the environment that Jesus came to and what is so powerful about his preaching and the way he brings forth the gospel and the healing and what he is looking to do is he's seeing there are people in need and I have an answer for it. There are people in need who are hurting, who are weary, who are burdened, and I can bring something of relief to them. You see, the gospel is not just in word, it is also in deed. And it is shown in demonstration by what Jesus did. And if you look at what Jesus did, and even if you ask people that know little of Jesus, they might know more about what he did in terms of his example and his actions than they would even maybe specifically the gospel message. But yet when you hear of what he did, it speaks to all the good news of a kingdom that is different. Jesus Christ wants to bring healing into your life. Jesus Christ wants to deliver you from a place of darkness to a place of light. And when circumstances come in and put pressure on our hearts and minds, and what starts to come out is not godly, is not good, is not right, it creates the opportunity for the healing. How have you been doing through these trials? They've been going on for months now in the world and in our nation. You can, uh, you can see effects. What effects do you see in your own life? Have you seen a side of yourself that maybe you didn't know was there when you were told, hey, you need to shelter at home? You can't just go about your normal business. You can't just live life normally. There's a message that is being repeated, I just want to get back to the way it was. I just want to get back to the way it was. But I would ask you not to miss the opportunity because maybe the way it was was simply a mask to so much of what is within that needs to be dealt with that this gives opportunity to be dealt with because what is fruiting out isn't all pure like maybe we thought it was. And what is fruiting out is something quite sinister that needs to be dealt with. You see, the Christian life, the good news comes with the word repent and believe. Because what is being challenged is the very authority and governance that we look to in life that was all distorted from the beginning when Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit and rejected the commandment, will, and love of God to do something for self, to be of self, to take for self, to choose a completely different course. How did the ruler of the world get established? He got established by choice. And how does the ruler 
from heaven above, the Savior Jesus Christ, get established. It is by choice. You saying, I submit to the right governance. I submit to loving leadership. I choose love over hate. I choose kindness over rudeness. In my own ways, I choose God. I choose good. I choose the kingdom of God. You see, sin is a symptom of something that's going wrong in the very heart of what we really believe and who we really believe. When Jesus says repent and believe the gospel, it is because there is a different way that literally produces righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is a different way that brings about healing and restoration and reconciliation and liberty. Sometimes we think we need to fight all these different ways to get there. The word of God already reveals the truth. All the world's problems can be solved through the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. He is a king that has a kingdom that will go on and on forever and not need a replacing of governance or of leadership because the heart and the mind in the kingdom is so pure, so right, it can be repeated day after day after day because it is not based on selfishness. It is based on love. It is based on service. It is based on giving. And what Jesus did in coming to this world was to say, I see that you're all sinning, but I come to bring love. That good would overcome evil. And what Jesus wants us to understand and realize is the deliverance of the gospel must come with his heart and mind, not with a heart and mind of hatred, but with a heart and mind of how can I bring good into your life? How can I lead you and help you? You're lost. Let me help you. Come to Jesus. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm not the answer, but I know Jesus has the answer. And what can happen in your life happens by the King of kings and the Lord of lords coming in and you saying, I want to have my citizenship in heaven. I want to let go of the things of this world and have the things of heavenly causes. My hope is in the return of Jesus Christ. My hope is in the establishment of a new kingdom. And while I'm here as an ambassador for this kingdom in Jesus Christ, I will deliver the good news of the kingdom of God that is coming. Friends, it is a kingdom where there is no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears because the former things are going to pass away. And everything that Jesus is working for as a king is to bring healing, wholeness, life, liberty, joy into your life. And what the world wants us to do is get so focused on a message of darkness. It comes from selfishness and it's deceitful because what it offers is do what you want, please yourself. And it can seem like, well, that would make me happy if I just do what I want to do. But that, therein lies the deceitfulness. When you do just what you want to do and don't think, but what does this mean a year from now? What does this mean to this person over here? You don't think about the repercussions. See, the wisdom of God comes in perfect love and wisdom with such a mind to think, what's the reality? What? is the reality of it. Times like this that we go through that seem hard and trying bring out in us the things that need to be dealt with. And as Christians, we don't run from what needs to be dealt with. We come confessing so that we can believe in the right things of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, and we can do the things that he wants us to do. That's why we repent. Do you want the joy of the gospel in your life? Do you want to be free from fear, from pain, from brokenheartedness, from oppression? You see, these things are available to those that come to the gospel, to those who obey the gospel and come to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and say, you're my Lord. I want you now. It doesn't mean that in this world we won't have troubles. What it means is that inside you have a pathway to healing. And in the end, all of this corruption will put on incorruption. And all of this mortal will put on immortality. And we will come to a place where we rise to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with him. 
do you see that day? Everything in your life projecting to that day. See, it is the love of God, the promises of God, of the resurrection and eternal life that lead us to repentance, that lead us to belief. But make no doubt, you have a choice of what rulership you want in your heart and what rulership you want in your life. Do you choose the way of Satan who says, take and do what you want, do what you will, or do you have a confession for Christ as the king of your life who says, come to me, follow me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. You see, the way of the world fruits darkness. The way of the world fruits war. It fruits argument. It fruits broken relationship and strife. The way of Jesus produces healing, peace, confidence, joy, and assurance forever. That's really what this is about. And all the the things that can distract us in the world and all the specific things that can try to block our mind from what the very simple truth is, believe the gospel and accept Jesus Christ into your midst and you will be set free. Do you believe that? Do you believe what he can do, what he comes to offer? In Matthew, again, chapter 9 In verse 35 or 36, he says, So when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. I've had so many conversations in the last couple weeks where I have heard these words and I relate. I'm just tired. I'm weary. I feel overwhelmed. My system has been shocked and I'm just trying to capture where I am. The number of times I've heard people say, I lose track of what day it is. I lose track of where time has gone. I lose track of... See, all of this actually can be a tremendous blessing if when we identify there's something going on inside of us and we come back to the king and remember who we are and where his timing is, and who he is in our lives. There is one stable, steadying king who can change everything for you and me. And he sees weariness, and he doesn't run from it. He sees sheep without shepherd, and he doesn't say, well, they're lost, and write them off. He sees, and he goes to that. You see, the thing is that when you come to sin in your life, when you come to a place where you feel lost, when you're asking questions, when you're wondering what it is, Jesus, you want me to do, there's no one more engaged and interested in answering for you. He loves to lead you in the ways of righteousness. He wants to show you the path. And what that path looks like is founded in a repentance and a faith, a belief in the gospel that we would continually come to Jesus through the hardest times in our lives. But I also want you to think about how have you been measuring that out in your own life today as Christians? As followers of Jesus, it's easy to look at lawlessness and find yourself not just condemning lawlessness, but condemning those practicing the lawlessness. Are you glad that Jesus didn't do that to you? Jesus came to bring healing where it could be received. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He seems to allow the choice of belief to be yours. He allows you the dignity of believing the master that you choose. But if the solution is repentance and belief, then how are we living that out and presenting it not only to ourselves when we find our lawlessness and need to confess and repent and receive the forgiveness of Jesus, but how are we pushing that out to others? You see, 
What do we do when we see a world going nuts? What do we do when we see lawlessness? You know, when you see the stores broken open and you see streams of people running in and stealing stuff and taking it back out and running in, and you look at this over and over and you're like, that was there all the time. It was just the right times and circumstances that created the opportunity, but what would drive people to go in and do that, to destroy property, to beat people up, to murder people, to uh, steal property. It was there all along. We get so faked out by the veneers of society when they say peace, peace, yet there is no peace. But we sometimes fake ourselves out too because what we do is we build schedules and time horizons and we, we establish things in our own lives to kind of create veneers sometimes too. Praise be to God that sometimes the veneers get cracked, that we can peer into what's going on in our lives and allow God to show us a view of what he can see because no veneers ever stopped him from seeing the truth. And he's never been lost. We're the lost. And what we find when we find him is we find ourselves, we find where he is, but he wasn't lost. We are the lost. And to come to a revelation in our own hearts and minds is to come and understand the compassion that Jesus has for who we are because he sees behind all the veneers. He sees behind all the facades. He sees all the games of religiosity we can play of our own goodness when yet what really resides within are things that we would rather not share. But God says, no, share. That you can let go of falsehood and embrace truth. We sin because we believe a lie. We sin because we believe a lie. We accept the authority of an evil one who wants to lead us astray instead of receiving and accepting the authority of one who wants to lead us down a straight path to everlasting life. And the thing that goes on in our hearts and minds that gets revealed through different times and through different circumstances and through different opportunities is what's going on. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be honest and understand what is playing out in our lives and what plays out in what we bring both to ourselves and to others. Turn with me over to Psalms chapter 139. Psalm chapter 139. In Psalms chapter 139, it says this in verse 23. Psalms 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. In the Hebrew, it literally just means the, tr the thoughts that trouble you within. Do you have any troubled thoughts within, even right now? See, those don't go away by burying them. They go away by exposing, confessing, and allowing Jesus to be king in us to deal with the lawlessness that he does. See, Jesus is interested in getting rid out of your heart and your mind all things that offend and all things that cause lawlessness. That's how he brings about a purity. He does the work. It is his authority over the authority of another that brings that about. And notice it says, and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God sees exactly what's going on in us and if we desire it, he can reveal it to us. But he does it not to condemn us, but to bring healing into our lives. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that he can bring about a re reconciliation and a redemption within, regardless of what is there right now? Because this is where the real authority of the gospel it's right here. This is ground zero. You've got to go back and say, what have I been doing, thinking, and believing that has been leading me down a wrong course, and what do I need to think and believe and receive in order to come down the right course? 
the authority of Christ or the authority of this world? Is the ruler of the world the one guarding, guiding us or is the ruler in heaven the one guiding us? This is the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, that we become citizens who follow the ways of our king and that we promote that to others. But what our king does when he sees us in lawlessness is not come to, to condemn us. He comes to save us. And now this is what I want us to see because when we find ourselves seeing the sin, the lawlessness, and the circumstances in people's lives, what are we bringing to the table? Are we bringing the condemnation that comes from the law as it states, or are we trying to bring the healing that comes from compassion, understanding, empathy, and mercy? When Jesus was saying he was filled with compassion, when he said that people are burdened and heavy laden, when he's saying that they're going astray, they have no shepherd. He was identifying the weakness in mankind. My friends, that weakness is going to stay that weakness until they come to the king and make a choice for life in Jesus Christ. Do you think there's another way under heaven? There's no other name, right, Brian? There is no other name. Do we think somehow there's another way? We can talk them out of sin. Do we think somehow there's another governance or authority that can make it all end? Do we think somehow technology or a higher agenda or whatever that is that man might propose is a solution? Is it just a clever phrase? Is it just a saying when we say there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved other than the name of Jesus? Is it just a saying or is there truth? Because I submit to you today that it is the truth and that you and I are in the same desperate need when we are apart from Christ and everyone who runs into a store to loot needs Jesus Christ. You want to stop hate? You need Jesus. You want to stop murder? You need Jesus. You want to stop abortion? You need Jesus. You want to stop racism? You need Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. Do we think we will talk sinners out of sin without Jesus? Do we think that just identifying what they're doing wrong and shouting, you're wrong, is going to do it? I tell you, it's not by condemning. It is by offering salvation. It is a different path. What man has not seen because of the clever deceitfulness that Satan brings upon the world and the delusion that comes is that believing lies on and on and on will somehow produce goodness somewhere down the road that we can get it right. I tell you, we have to go back to the very beginning and the very basic things, the gospel of the kingdom of God, that there is one king who has earned the right to be king, an empathetic, compassionate king who is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who loves to heal and show mercy and kindness. This is the nature of a people that submits to a king. It is the nature of the church that we do not engage in the warfare with this world in the way the world does. We engage by the power of a higher power as ambassadors for Christ in this world to deliver the message that our kingdom is the only kingdom that can ever bring about peace. In those who seek to operate outside of the kingdom of God will never come to know the way of peace, the way of life the way of hope, the way of liberty, because inside, no matter how good you can make your veneer look, inside, you're still submitting to an authority that is not the ultimate, true, pure, loving authority. It's something you devised. It's something you submitted to. You're either a fool for Christ or you're a fool for the world. Who are you? You see, Jesus wants us to believe in who we are, but that belief is not just a knowledge of the truth of who you are. You were called to be a child of God. You were called to be holy and accepted in the blood. You were called to be healed. See, the kingdom of God is better because it doesn't hurt anybody. And the kingdom of God is better because it comes with a willingness and a desire to understand the interests of others. You know, 
the one thing that I've really learned through all of this, and I've, I've taken it for myself, I've seen it evidenced in others, but then I see it evidenced in myself of how narratives that people have and perspectives, when there isn't a willingness to try to understand, they just cross each other. It's like, they just, it's like the, it's like the words go right past. There's no penetration. There's no understanding. It's just, they pass. I don't know how you build reconciliation and relationships when words are just going past people. When there is no desire to understand. And you know what's amazing is how much of our narrative is driven by sin. How much by pain, how much by hurt, how much by what I've experienced, how much by what I know. And these things become the shapers of our directions and the shapers of our opinions. And we don't seek to have understanding that maybe somebody else's walk is different than your walk. I've had a chance to talk to many of my friends and uh, even employees that I have that their experience in life has been completely different than my experience. And the more that I can listen with a heart to love and understand, to see the hurt and the weakness, the more there can be almost a catharsis where the person opens up and it gives you an opportunity to present the gospel of the kingdom of God. You see, have you ever found somebody that really opens up when there is rage on the other side, when the person's not listening, when the person's not engaging in a loving manner? Maybe some of you have. Anybody? Is anybody? Yeah, you, you find that? The, the more harsh you are with somebody, the more they open up to you? No? I know sometimes it happens. I've, I've had some conversations with Mr. Brad about that. I've, I'm going to say that most of my personal experiences, the, the more non-listening and angry I am, the less people open up about the truth. I'm not saying that it can't happen the other way. But until you get to that moment where a person's willing to open their heart, how do you really begin to plant the gospel in there? Jesus was healing people because people need to know there is love and there is healing and there is compassion and there is mercy. It brings out the truth for the right reasons and it brings it out for a motivation of good, trying to get the person to see the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God. In every opportunity I've had, I've had opportunity as a friend, I've had opportunity as uh, a pastor, which might not be that much different, and also as an employer to talk to people through this. I realize that narratives can run so deep and so strong The question isn't challenging the validity of it. The question actually is, well, how did that start for you? Where did that begin? Why do you feel that way? And what is interesting is that most people, when you ask those questions, they already have answers. And if you push them to answer, a little bit when they say, I'm not sure, saying, really? Well, when was the first time you can remember feeling that way? And usually it comes down to a moment of sin that has never been forgiven or addressed. And a sin impact a life, and now it changes the direction of opinion and thinking because you're reacting to pain and you're reacting to hurt. And there's no maturation that God would want to see taking place in our lives. And that's why this prayer is so powerful. When David says in Psalm 139, Search me, O God. Search me. Search me and know my heart. Do you find in your life that you just ever have outbursts of emotion? 
that you don't even know why you're so frustrated or angry or upset. You just, all of a sudden you are. And it's like, it's not making sense when you try to look at your life logically. You're like, why am I feeling so strongly about this? Why am I getting upset? Why am I feeling enraged? Why am I getting angry? And you start to look at this. These are telltale signs and symptoms. Something's going on there. It's more than just the event. There's something that's led up to the event. There are things that are going on in your heart and mind. This is what David wants to know. Try me and know my anxieties. Why are you afraid? Why are you so angry? Why are you found in weakness when God wants to make you strong? You see, there are narratives that get planted in our hearts and minds. We start reacting to sin where it doesn't get dealt with. In whatever ways that we can, our experiences shape us in a way where we start to almost create our own law, our own kingdom of how we do life. And the beauty is that when Jesus comes along, he's like, my whole ministry is to show you something so much better for you. Because Jesus says, I love you. I want you to be free. I want you to be liberated. I want you to know what it is to have joy in your life, even in the worst of circumstances. To know what it is to know that there is life that is going on on this earth that is not about what the kings of this world are doing, but what the king of heaven is doing and where he wants you to be. You've got to be willing to let your heart be searched and to miss an opportunity like this when people's schedules and veneers and life has been interrupted. Don't miss the chance because what is bubbling up could be good things, keep keep on keeping on, or negative things. What direction are you taking? Turn with me over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus here is speaking, and and this was as he entered the synagogue, and and he's going to read words that are about him. And he goes in, and it says in verse 17 of Luke 4, a book was handed to him, it was the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord, of Yahweh, his Father, is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Do you believe that even to this day, Jesus still does this work? Because this is the difference between what the kingdom of God looks like in a person's life and what the kingdom of the world looks like in a person's life. The kingdom of the world offers with it hope in pleasure and in doing what you want, but what it brings is poverty, brokenheartedness, captivity, blindness, and oppression. Don't ever kid yourself into thinking it brings anything other than that because that is exactly what the king of this world, the ruler of this world did when he deceived mankind and deceived Eve into taking of the fruit and when Adam also took and sinned. And every one of us, you and me, every time that we reject the commandment and word of the Lord, we are choosing of the same tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what we have determined to be good for food, pleasing to the eyes, desirable to make one wise, to puff us up, to build us up, to make us happy with pleasure of the world. When we take of the things of the world that do not lead to life, that is what we're doing. And ultimately, we are submitting to another ruler, a lesser ruler than God, but nonetheless a ruler who has authority and power in this world to deceive the nations. And we partake in a deception to say, somehow the law doesn't apply to me. We do that when we're not married and we sleep together. 
and commit sexual immorality. We do that when we go into stores that are broken open and steal things. We steal money, we steal goods, we steal merchandise. It happens when we lie and don't tell the truth, when we deceive, when we manipulate, when we use our position in business to get people on a different road so we can profit from it. It happens when we don't remember our creator and remember the laws that he made. It happens when we twist his words into being something that they're not meant to be. And every time we reject the word of the Lord and we walk down a path that is of our own making, I want you to realize you and I, when we do that, we are submitting to another authority in our lives. It is an authority that comes with lies that we must overcome. You can't keep believing lies and ever come to a true place of righteousness, peace, and joy. It won't happen. They run contrary. It's a different path. When we choose to reject the word of God and the ways of God to do our own will in our relationships with him and with others, we end up impoverished. We end up captives, brokenhearted, oppressed, blind. Knowing the law, how do you want to live? Knowing that's where it ends up and that's where it always goes, how do you want to choose? You see, this was really the choice when God called his people together and he said, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. He's saying, choose life, don't you see? Life, life, life to me. Choose life. And this is the calling when Jesus came forth with the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's saying, I'm a king with a better way. Therefore, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Continuing on in uh, Luke chapter 4, I want you to just look there what Jesus said. He said he would come to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. I've been so poor in my life, and I love when God comes with a happy word and a joyful word of what he is doing. Don't you? And it says, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Have you been brokenhearted? Are you brokenhearted? Are you just masking your hurt and not really dealing with the fact that you're hurting? I was talking to somebody this last week, and I asked these questions that I was saying earlier. I just said, well, where do you think that started? And the person told me a story of injustice in their life, and he said, I don't know that I've ever told anybody that story. And to me, I'm just thinking, thank you, God, for bringing something out from childhood that is having a moment here that can bring about where do pain and brokenheartedness and emotions come from that can go on without being dealt with and create such havoc in people's lives. Don't you know that when we ask God to search us and try us, that the goal is to get to the pain points and the brokenheartedness so we can come to him and say, heal me. You don't have to provide your own healing. Don't be scared to believe the truth. I ask you, do you believe these words? Do you believe Jesus can heal what is broken in your heart and heal the things, no matter how bad it was or how many times maybe a person has done it to you over and over and over again, to heal your heart, to be free of that? Jesus comes and his kingdom is to proclaim liberty and give it to the captives. He leads captivity captive. And what he does with those who become captives or citizens of his kingdom is he gives life, liberty, property, joy, and good things. That's what God wants to do. That's what he wants his citizens to experience. Recovery of sight to the blind. Do you think that God can remove the blinders from your eyes? Do you look to your king to do this for you in your life? To set at liberty those who are oppressed, do you know that he can take you out of every oppression, whether it's drug addiction, 
pleasure addiction, eating addictions, whatever addiction, whatever oppression is holding you in your life, do you know that he can take you out of that? And the oppressions that come from bitterness and resentment and anger because of sin that just keeps dominion in your life. Jesus did not come to save us, to allow us to stay in dominion to sin. Rather, he wants us to receive the dominion of grace. See, when he dominates your heart with grace, he brings about peace. Let Jesus dominate your thinking with his grace, his love, and his mercy, and allow him to heal the deepest places and expect it to happen. Why is believing the gospel of the kingdom of God so important? Because knowing the gospel of the kingdom and knowing about Jesus isn't what provides or produces the healing. It doesn't change things. Believing in it does. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe and allow him to be acquainted with your hurts and confess your sins. Allow him to be king in your heart and in your life and give him the place of dominion where you say, your word is what I want in my life. Your way is what I want. No one can stop the authority of Jesus Christ in you. Do you realize that you, as an individual made in the image and likeness of God, when you choose God, and you say, Jesus, I choose you, no one, no place can stand against that choice when you come to Jesus and say, I receive you into my heart, I receive you into my life. Nobody can stand against that. You are the only one that God has ever given the authority to not believe the truth. If you will believe, you shall be healed. Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. What is preventing this from happening? What is the work of God? It's not just about going about doing miracles. People said, give us the power. He said, do the work of God. What is the work of God? To believe in the Father and in the Son. The faith, the belief, this is the work. If you want to be engaged in the kingdom of God, be engaged in believing the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Be believing in what Jesus said he came to do. He wants to remove your blindness. He wants to heal you from your brokenheartedness. He wants to free you where you're captive and set the oppressor off you. He wants to liberate you. There is no one who can stop him. No, not even one. You have been offered promises of redemption and eternal life that will stand forever, and no one, no one can take it from you. So why would we ever let anyone... When times and circumstances reveal the nature of our hearts, it is the time to come clean before God. It is the time to be reconciled before God and to reconcile to others. There is so much hate and animosity that's been built on the frustration of people feeling oppressed, people feeling a lack of liberation, people feeling it. And what is birthing out of it is actually a time to say, look, look at what we're doing, look at what we're thinking, look at what we're saying. Whose side are we on? We take our stand with Jesus Christ. Let no one deceive you. Don't be blinded by hate or anger or frustration. Where you feel it, seek redemption, seek forgiveness. Ask God to search you, to try you. Ask God to show you where you're not submitting to him. Ask God to show you where Jesus is not the king of your life. The way to peace in this world is through the hearts and minds of individuals like you and me who receive of Jesus Christ and say, don't let it stop. I want you all the way, Jesus. All the way. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. I want you, wonderful king. I want you, prince of peace, the word of life. I want you. My friends, Christianity is not just about a set of practices. It is about a relationship with God. And that relationship comes by you believing in who he is and allowing him to be who he is, to be God in your life, to heal your brokenheartedness, to remove the blindness, to set you free God can change your heart 
God can change your mind, and there is no one who can stop him from doing that. But what you must do is make the choice to believe in him and allow him to enter into the very deep places of your heart and mind where maybe there is pain and maybe there is sorrow and maybe there is bitterness and maybe there is resentment. Things that pop up when you least expect it that are there abiding all the time and God can take to a deeper place his holiness and righteousness in you. Do not leave this place today without asking God to search you. Do not leave this place today without asking God to be in your heart and in your mind, believing the things that we just read, that he still does these things today. We need the peace and the love. It doesn't come by saying, let's have peace and love. It comes by Jesus. It's not by power or by might, but by his spirit that we become who we're supposed to be. By his grace, you can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You were made to be redeemed. You were made in life. You were called. He gave you understanding. You are not here today because you haven't received. Yes, you have received, but now go all the way. Go all the way for Jesus Christ and let him be the king of your life.